what I think happened here. Epitaph. Though only a girl, the firstborn of the Pharaoh, I was the first to die. Young then, we were bored already. Rouged pink as oleanders on the palace grounds, petted by the eunuchs, overfed from gem-encrusted bowls, barren with wealth. Until the hours of the afternoon seemed to outlast even my grandmother's mummy, a perfect little dried apricot in a golden skin. We would paint to pass the time with delicate brushes dipped in char on clay or on our own blank lids. So it was that day we found him wailing in the reeds. He seemed a miracle to us, plucked from the lotus by the ibis beak, the squalling seed of the sacred Nile. He was permitted as a toy. While I pretended play, I honed him like a sword. For him, I was as polished and as perfect as a pebble in a stutterer's mouth. While the slaves' fans beat incessantly as insect wings, I taught him how to hate this painted pharaoh's tomb, this palace built of brick and dung and gilded like a poet's tongue, these painted eyes. I that's think, a that's some poem. <laughs> well, I think you can see that what this is about is about female complicity in male rage. Um, it also gives you a pretty. Is good it about idea. mothering? I mean, I'm the mother of a son. Yes. And I do worry about how I'm doing. Yes. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. do you think that, well, it's a, this is a bored, unfulfilled woman who's creating a rage-filled child. Yes. Male. Yes. Uh, yes, denied an outlet for her herself. own power. She turns him, and I honed him like a sword. She makes him her weapon. Um, it also explains why the daughter of a tyrant would make the perfect nurturer, the leader of a, of a slave. That's a revolt. wonderful insight. I wonder if that's been ever discussed in biblical studies. It's I have no so idea, interesting. But just, I yeah. didn't know when I was started to write this kind of poetry that there's something called Midrashim, <laughs> which um, I know. The commentary on the Bible. Right. Yeah. Well, essentially, um, what I often find happening is that what is the biggest impulse for me for, for poetry is this, the great silence behind us. Um, I once read um, something Mandelstam, the great uh, Russian poet, said. He said, I have no personal memory. I have only a cultural memory. And I remember thinking, oh, whew, another one. I felt so relieved to hear that um, because as a poet, Obviously, as a person, I remember some stuff. But, um, but as a poet, cultural memory, um, the emotions that are too powerful to be only personal are the ones that seem to be the impulse for the poems. But in particular, my cultural memory is different from Mandelstein's. Mm -hmm. I'm a Western woman. And for me, in that, along with the, the tradition and the cultural memory, um, is all that's missing from it. I think behind us as women is this great silence, hmm. um, all of the, pub, the public silence, where women were not heard and where their voices were not recorded. And so it's out of that silence that these voices seem to come. And in, in some sense, they borrow my, um, my eyes, which have the hindsight of we are living in a different time. They come to change the past in order that we can have a different present, I think, and a more open future. So do you feel you're channeling these? This, I mean, this channeling word, this, I mean, I know, and it's, again, it's a very flat word. Yeah. But you, this, it's interesting that what lies behind is silence, and yet you're speaking, you're mm -hmm. giving them voice. Yes. So there is a, a sense in which you're, you are a conduit for, yes. for, but I'm also and they're giving me voice. They're too, giving you voice because, because you're writing the poem, and I guess they're giving you inspiration. Essentially, yes, a transpersonal voice, which is to say, 
a voice that um, enlarges and deepens the personal and connects it across time and with others, um, but doesn't dilute the singularity of it. Well, you know, I'm very interested in something you said just a minute ago about how you feel that only the personal voice, when it, when it connects with the cultural voice, is powerful enough to write a poem. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, leads me into a question I had about mm -hmm. your poetry in general, mm -hmm. in that it is never, uh, well, you rarely use I, mm -hmm. except in a persona, persona form. Right, yeah. You are not a confessional poet. I mean, you use that uh, term that so many poets do call themselves mm -hmm. or are part mm -hmm. of that tradition. Mm -hmm. Is that very self-conscious on your part, that you do not feel that just writing about yourself or writing about your I guess, aches and pains, metaphorical or literal, are worthy of poetry? Um, is that how you would put it? Because you need to have be speaking for more than yourself? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that it's, in, it's a particularly conscious choice. Um, and there's some very great poems that are written in the lyric confessional voice. I have, you know, I have no doubt of that. Um, there's a couple of, of answers to that. Um, one of them is, is, is simply that this is the way it's come to me. Um, but the other is, you know, I was talking to a friend some years ago, and I, I noticed that I was terribly bored. And I realized that what I was talking about was myself. I just, I had lost interest. It, it, didn't, it wasn't a subject that, um, so it doesn't really interest you. No, you write doesn't. about what interests but you. But also, there is a way in which I'm involved in the epitaph poem I just read, because I'm saying the personal, the transpersonal is also personal. But there's, there's um, another and deeper reason behind that boredom. When you're talking about yourself often, um, you're saying what you already know. And if someone says, what's the matter? You know, it's very hard to say what it is. And it seems to me that we're given this other language, um, the language of imagination, which involves image and invention, and um, for me, opens up the places where we connect in order to get at things which are not only um, intangible and difficult to know or talk about, but which are also essentially the place which is deepest in us, is to me an intersection mm -hmm. of the collective, of the choral, and the singular. And you know, as Americans, we're always taught, you know, oh, you know, you can be anything you want, and you make yourself up, and you're an individual, and everything is personal, and the Marlboro man thinks for himself, you know, that howler. Um, that kind of mythology pushes me further into to saying, no, that's, I mean, that's why I studied anthropology, because I, I was interested in the fact that um, when you look at other cultures, you see that people assume that their poets or their shamans or whatever are, are dreaming for the collective. Yes. And this is, these are stories and things, figures from our dream time, which we need to dream again, because we're living in a different time than when these stories were written. Well, we don't have much time, and I would like you, you've been uh, talking about the collective, and mm -hmm. there is a, a very vibrant poetry scene in, in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and almost all these poets read periodically at Robin's Bookstore, which yes. some of our audience may know. Yeah. I've read there, uh, so has my place. producer, and I know you've read there uh, many times. Mm. And you wrote a poem, uh, it's on the, on the road to Larry Robbins, bookstore. Okay. I love this poem, and it is, it's one of, I won't say few, but it's one of those poems that doesn't make use of anything but what's around. It's not, yes. uh, it's not making allusions to the past this or to myth true. or whatever. And, um, oh, or if a man is in it, though. <laughs> yeah. Could you read that poem for us? Uh -huh. I will say that um, this was written for uh, the occasion when a hundred poets came together for the first time for Larry. We were trying to save Robbins, which is our city lights and the independent bookstores are so important, and they're going out of business so fast. And it's still around. He's still, He's around, still around and yeah. thriving. Yeah. Um, 
and it's the free speech center of our city. On the road to Larry Robbins' bookstore, it's also grimy. Our many monsters, the ashes of the members of Moon, good memories. The splashed blood on the marble steps from the latest murder, the comforting sight of safe sex, its wilted, cast-off condoms. The needles that line the back streets like the floors of a forest of pine. And everywhere, the warm steam of dog shit, the reeling passers-by, eyes as blank as orphan Annie's. The stands where they sell umbrellas from Hong Kong that break in the first rainstorm. The brisk Koreans cutting endless melons into small squares for the passing lawyers who carry them in little plastic boxes up 30 floors to rooms where they grind the faces of the poor in the towers that Rouse built and for which he has paid no taxes. Or the stale pretzels which carbon date to some time before the signing of the declaration, smeared with mustard, whose color is a yellow never seen in nature. The hot dogs, resembling that part within easy reach that almost got Clinton impeached. <laughs> Till at last we step over the homeless and the potholes for which our city is justly famous and enter the small door to one of the last independent bookstores being slowly crushed to death, like the hero of a tale by Poe, by the closing in of borders. We pass through its serious downstairs with the literature of social redemption and climb the winding, disintegrating stair to the chamber of horrors where the happy voyeurs lounge among porno, magazines where the body count is boundless, and where we, among friends and lovers of meaning, make our last stand for the language. In that squalor where the muse, that battered hag, tears her split hairs and rattling her bones, squats and stirs the cauldron of art, happy to be back at Robbins, happy to feel so at home. That's a really wonderful poem. I want to thank you so much, Eleanor Wilner, for being here. I wish we could talk more. Thank you, Pam. We will talk me. afterward and catch up, and uh, it's been great. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview.